Oh God, we come in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and ask you to bless us as we assemble in your name today. We thank you that we have your word open before us and we pray that as we now read it and hear it expounded, it may be a blessing to us. Speak, Lord. You spoke through the prophets in times past. You've spoken by your son. You've spoken by the apostles. We pray you'll speak through your word now uh, as we hear it expounded. May it be a blessing to us. May it come to us with power and life. May it be in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. And may we be given hearts to receive your word, minds to understand and wills to obey. So bless us and help us now that we might worship you as we Listen to your word, for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, I ask you to turn to the book of Exodus, the second book in the Bible, very near the beginning, Exodus and chapter 40, the last chapter in the uh, book of Exodus. You know, the Exodus records what it says, the Exodus, the deliverance of Israel, uh, from Egypt, making over them into a nation and the tremendous deliverance and uh, the passing of the Red Sea, the giving of the law and all the rest, and the building of the tabernacle. And in chapter 40 we get a summary, as it were, of that work, the setting up of the tabernacle. I won't read all the chapter, let me just read some of the relevant verses. So we'll start at verse 1 of Exodus 40. Then the Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle. This was this tent. I mean, but just an ordinary tent, of course. It was a remarkably uh, big tent and a wonderful organized tent. Set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting on the first day of the month. Place the ark of the testimony in it and shield the ark within the curtain. Bring in the table and set out what belongs on it. Then bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. Place the gold altar of incense in front of the ark of the testimony and put the curtain at the entrance to the tabernacle. And so on it goes on. What he has to do with the various bits and pieces of the furniture. Verse 6 up to verse 8. Then verse 9 Take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and everything in it and so on. Consecrate it and all its furnishings and it will be holy. And then in verse 12 you get uh, Aaron and his sons. These are the priests. And they have to be dressed, verse 13, in the sacred garments which have been made according to God's word. Anoint him and consecrate him so that he may serve me as priest, and so on. And then you get this chorus in verse 16. I say a chorus because it comes more than once. Moses did everything just as the Lord commanded him. Uh, then verse 17, uh, the tabernacle is erected and put up in its place. And the curtains, several layers of curtains and things were placed over it. And then it says in verse 19, as the Lord commanded him. You'll see that there. And then it says in verse 20 that he took the testimony and placed it in the ark, attached the poles to the ark and so on. And he put the ark, this box, this chest in the tabernacle. And you get the chorus again in verse 21, as the Lord commanded him. Verse 22, then there's the table and the bread on the table. Verse 23, again you get as the Lord commanded him. And then the lampstand, verse 24, again in verse 25, as the Lord commanded him. And so it goes on. Verse 29, as the Lord commanded him. Verse 32, as the Lord commanded Moses. And so we get the conclusion at verse 33, and so Moses finished the work. 
Have you got the message? He did it as the Lord commanded him. Okay? Well, some of you men in your minds be coming to the other end of the Bible and remembering a passage in the New Testament. I think it's, um, yes, it's chapter 8 of Hebrews. That's a long way on. That's in a totally different time. Moses, Exodus, that's way back in the days of the Old Covenant, right in the very early days of the Old Covenant. Hebrews were in the days of the New Covenant, when all the Old Covenant has been fulfilled and rendered obsolete, because it's completed. Completed because Christ has come and brought the reality of all that the Old Covenant spoke of. But even so, when the writer to the Hebrews writes his letter, chapter 8 of Hebrews, um, he makes this point about the priesthood and so on. But this is what he says in chapter 8 and verse 5. This is why Moses was warned, that's a strong word, warned by God, of course, when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. That's referring to Mount Sinai. God is saying to Moses, I want you to build a tent. Nobody ever built one before. I want you to build a tabernacle, a special place where I will meet with the children of Israel. I'm going to make it up. I want you to build this tabernacle according to a certain pattern. And God showed him that pattern. It was a heavenly pattern. Now, if you're still with it, what God was doing to Moses was showing him the reality. And what Moses had to do was bring back and make a copy of that reality in physical terms for a tabernacle. That's, you'll find that in Exodus 25 and verse 40. That's when God told him. Now in Exodus chapter 40, Moses has done it. And he's built this tabernacle exactly according to the pattern he was shown on the mount. It says it over and over again. He's commended for it. This is a commendation. He was warned in chapter 25, don't budge an inch, or whatever the measurement was. Don't go to the left or to the right. Don't make up any mind of your own. What you've seen in the vision, in the pattern, do it. And he did it. The writer of the Hebrews thinks this is very important. Because God thinks it's very important. This is precisely what God wants. When he tells Moses to do something, Moses has to do it. That's not just true for Moses. Remember what Mary says in the wedding at Cana. She said to the people, you know, whatever he says to you, well, think about it. No. Whatever he says to you, well, chew it over. No. Whatever he says to you, do it. I wrote a tract for Roman Catholics. You think very much of Mary. Well, okay. Do you follow her advice? Whatever he says to you, do it. <laughs> not Mr. Pope. Not the priest. Not the cardinals. Not the councils. Whatever he says to you, do it. What did Jesus say? If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. <laughs> Got the message yet? From one end of the Bible to the other, this is what God wants, this is what God expects, this is what God demands, this is what he is pleased with. Obedience. Obedience. 
If, if I look back and remember, when I was a young Christian, back in the days of Noah, it seems now so long ago, but back in those days, this seemed to be taken for granted among us. I don't know if it was or not, but it seemed to be taken for granted. I, I don't know, you know more about the churches today, but uh, is it taken for granted now that whatever God says to us, we have to do? Let me give you some more verses to think about. When the prophet Isaiah, see this is going somewhere else now, chapter 8 and verse 20, when he says this, to the law and to the testimony, to the word of God. That's what he means. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Do you believe that? If men speak, so say in the name of God, and what they say has not come from the law and from the testimony, in Isaiah's terms that means the word of God, it's because there's no light in them. Well, they're nice men. I, mean, I get told that all the time. He's a nice man. I dare say he is a nice man. But if he doesn't speak according to the word of God, I don't care how nice he is. In fact, the more nice he is, the more dangerous he is. And how about the Bereans? Let's go somewhere else. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. How about the Bereans? Here's Paul preaching. And these Bereans, it says, they were more noble than other people. They were noble people. What do you mean? Well, Luke tells us in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, when Paul was speaking, they did say, oh, that's lovely, isn't it? With their mouths open and their just brains in neutral. What they said was, well, we'll have a look at the scriptures and see. And if it speaks according to the scriptures, we'll receive it. And the Bible, God, Luke, commends the Bereans for being of a noble spirit. When they, if they give the parallel, if they went into chapel, they didn't leave their brains at the door. They were listening. And they didn't leave their Bibles at home. They had their Bibles there and they were thinking, is this man speaking according to the scriptures or not? I think the message is clear anyway. Moses did everything as God commanded him. Wouldn't that be a lovely thing on the gravestone? This man obeyed God. If it was really true. <laughs> That'd be an accolade, wouldn't it? That's what God says, by the way. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Yeah. And that comes from uh, Corinthians, of course. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful, obedient. Let me just t develop that just a second or two. This idea of the steward, when the boss man sends the steward to do a job, he expects him to do that job as he wanted it done. Remember when Abraham sent his steward to get a wife for his son? The steward said, well, you know, perhaps she won't come. Abraham said, that's all right, that's all right. So long as you've done the job I ask you to do, you've done the inviting, then you're clear, so long as you've obeyed me. Anyway, I think I've said enough on that. Moses obeyed God. Now, I want you to go back in your mind now. Here's Moses. He's built this tabernacle. It, nobody's ever built one before. It's like Noah with the ark. You see, nobody's ever built one before. That's a staggering work of faith, you know. And, and he's got these men, and they didn't say, oh, well, we'll, we'll change that. It says three rings in the pattern. Well, we'll make it four. No, no. They didn't go down the road and say to the Canaanites, now, how, how, how would you like it built? You know, they, No, no. They built it according to the pattern. Right. And Moses puts it there. I, I should imagine the Israelites, were, their eyes were on stalks when they saw it all going up, and all these curtains going over, and the furniture going in, and, and there was an inner tent, and then there was this box, and, you know, I don't know what, it must have been terrific, all these colors, and then Moses uh, dressing Aaron in these robes, and the anointing oil, I don't know, sacrifices, it must have been something terrific. 
And they all watched. Go back in your mind and look at it. Think at it. They might have walked around and looked at it. They might even have peeped in. They can't go in, but they might have peeped in. But it wouldn't be long, surely they'd be saying to themselves, what's all this about? Here's this huge thing. I mean, it wasn't just a, a little marquee, you know. It was a massive great thing. And um, what's it all about? There it stands, silent. Glorious, yeah. But of course, some of the Levites, the Levites all around, if God says move on, they've got to take all that down again and cart it to the next place. And the first thing they have to do is put it up again. Now, I've done a bit of camping in my time with family, and uh, it was quite modern tents, so they were all spring stuff and everything else, so it was quite good, it was quite easy. But you can get a bit fed up of loading and unloading tents out of cars and sticking them up, I can tell you. So you're only too glad to go and stay for several weeks and just stay there. But they must have wondered what it was all about. Because nothing happened. It was dead. Lifeless. And then we get verse 34 in Exodus 40. Something happened. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. Not just any old cloud. <laughs> the cloud of God. That cloud that had been in with them in the, you know, bringing them out of Egypt. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And it goes on like that. The point I see there is this. There's two strings to the bow this morning. The first string is this. Moses has to be obedient. And he is obedient. Right, we got past that. He's obedient. But that is not enough. Moses can be obedient. Great. If he's disobedient, that's terrible. So, I mean, that, that's, out of the, that's out of the window. Moses is obedient. But that is not enough. Something else must come into that obedience, must come into that tabernacle. And I think this is a vital point. What is the vital point? Until God comes in, until God enters and enters in his glory and in his power, the thing is useless. I think here is a huge, a massive principle. My job as a professing believer is to be obedient. Nothing more or less. That is what God will hold me to account for. Did I walk according to the light that he had shown me? Now whether that's in an individual life, my life, or in family life, in church life, in preaching life, or whatever life you like, talk what you like for a believer, in every aspect, obedience is number one. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. But obedience is not enough. Take preaching, for example. Say a man is faithful to the scriptures. Say a man is faithful in opening up the scriptures. He explains the scriptures. He puts it in the right sense. He brings home the application. Until God works in his power, nothing, nothing will be done. Oh, people might be amused or entertained or they might like it or not like it. That, that, that's not the point. But no lasting good will come unless God works in that word by his power. How do I know that? Well, the prophet Zechariah says this, not by might, nor by power, human power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's our first hymn. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Ghost. 
Unless God moves in the preaching of his word, there is no life in it. Again, you get it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 with the apostle. He says, I came in demonstration of the Spirit. This is a text we need big and large in the churches today. I came in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. It's not just being correct. It's not just being correct according to the Bible. It's, that correctness must be filled with the power of God's Spirit. Only the Spirit of God can make dead sinners live, you know. There's no eloquence of men can do it. You can get the poshest evangelist, the most clever evangelist, or what you want to call him. You can get the clever teacher. You can get his wonderful illustrations and everything else. But unless God gives the Spirit and his power, nothing will be done. Remember Ezekiel with the dry bones. God tells him to go into the graveyard and preach. And the graveyard is an open graveyard, and the, and the bleach bones in the sun are all lying there in the sun, white, and it's all dead. And they, uh, God says to Ezekiel, preach to him. <laughs> and he did. And you remember the vision, what he saw? The bones started coming together. Do you remember it? The bones began to come together. You remember the spiritual, the, the Negro spiritual. Them bone, them bone, them dry bones. You know, you, you know the, the, yeah. And he looked, and there was a mighty army as a result of his preaching. But they didn't move. And God said to him, preach again. <laughs> preach to the wind. Call upon the wind to come. So Ezekiel did it. And the wind entered, the Spirit of God entered the bones, and what, it became a mighty army and began to move. It was a tremendous picture to Ezekiel. This is what I will do for the dead house of Israel, says God. I will make the dry bones live. It's a tremendous picture of what God has to do in the preaching of his word. Jesus says, no man can come to me except the Father which sent me draw him. You say, oh, if only we could have Spurgeon back. Yeah. But if Spurgeon came back and the Spirit of God did not come back with him, then we would get nothing. You could read Spurgeon's sermon every week of the week, uh, every week of the year in the churches if you want to. Nothing will happen. But you can get any old village preacher who can hardly preach at all. If God's Spirit, <laughs> he can work wonders. A host of texts comes to mind. How about this one? About those who have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Remember Paul writes about those. People who have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. What's that talking about? There are people who are content to look like Christians, go to chapel, read their Bible, they might say, say their prayers and all the rest of it. They have a form of godliness, they're religious, but they do not know the power of God's Spirit within them. And Paul says that's useless. But you know, the churches, the chapels, in my experience, and I've been preaching now for 60 years, they've got a fair number of people who've got a, people there who've got a form of godliness, but they don't know the power of it. I mean it. They're excellent chapel goers. They're always there. Respectable, decent people. But do they know Christ in the power of God's Spirit? Without that, there is no life. There is no salvation. <laughs> I won't detain you long. But this, this really needs developing. Today, my friend, if I look around the churches, I see some of the old traditional churches. Are they obedient to God's word? Well, if you, I, I can't develop it now, but if, if you look at the church history, you'll find that what's in much of the traditional churches is nothing but what the fathers introduced, and that led to Rome. Now, you may not agree with me, but I can prove it to you if you want to talk afterwards. There is a life, it seems, in the traditional churches, which is often deadness. But then if you go to the modern evangelical, increasingly, 
They don't go to scripture first and foremost. They go to the world. I mean it. They go to Asda. They go to Tesco. They go to Walmart. They go to the global business. They go to the banks. They see how they get their customers, how they get their profits. They go to McDonald's and they say, how do you get people in here? And they bring the same into the churches. I say to you, if you go to many evangelical churches and an increasing number of evangelical churches, you can see precious little difference between McDonald's and the church. Moses will arise. He had to build the tabernacle, not according to McDonald's, but according to what God had shown him. And our job in the churches is to obey God in his word and call upon him for his power. Nothing else will do. Well, I probably haven't hit the mark for you, but I know what I'm referring to. I know what I'm looking for. We don't want just a deadness, dead orthodoxy. We want life according to the word of God. It's this twin thing, the obedience and the power of God's spirit. Individually, I don't want just religion. That's killing. I want to know Christ and the power of Christ and the power of his resurrection. Don't you? I want to obey God in his word. Nothing else will do. My friend, this applies to us all, individually, families, churches. May God apply it to us and show that he has been here this morning with the demonstration of the spirit and of power. And may this word have a living, lively effect. Amen.